Now we want to talk about interfaces and buses. Just want to give you this picture as the first example of all the different kinds of buses connections that appear in an embedded system. So what we're seeing here is a atom-based embedded development board. We have this atom microprocessor here. Uh, it connects to many different components, for example, to DRAM and to a chipset, which is a, a dedicated controller that is responsible for communicating between the microprocessor to all different kinds of devices. Here it has um, SPI, the serial connection, SATA, uh, the connection for storage devices, USB, PCIe, uh, etc. And as you can see, as peripheral devices, VGA, keyboard, audio, storage, you see all kinds of different <coughs> peripheral devices that work on different type of connections. In today's lecture, we're gonna look at, we start, we're gonna look at these different interfaces and buses. We're gonna look at first some basics about interfacing. Then we're gonna look at how microprocessor interface with address, uh, IO addresses, interrupts, and also direct memory access, um, these different type of ways to interfacing. And we're gonna talk about uh, arbitration for bus, and we're gonna look at different buses. And at the end, we're gonna look at um, several representative communication protocols, including serial, parallel, and wireless. There are essentially three major functions in the embedded system, processing, storage, and communication. Processing is where microprocessors or microcontrollers uh, doing the data manipulation, and storage is to retain information, retain data, either use memory or IO storage device. And the third element is communication. Communication is the transfer of data between processors and memories and between processors and IO devices. Often the time, it's implemented using buses. And this is what we call interfacing, the communication of data between processors and other components. We want to start with several simple concepts. A bus. First, let's talk about wires. Wires, they can be unidirectional or bidirectional. Depending on the data property, some wires, some connections are unidirectional, some are bidirectional. Now, when you look at schematic or block diagrams, keep in mind that a single line may represent multiple wires. And in fact, for a set of wires with a single function, we call this as a bus. That's why we have the term address bus and data bus. Using the example here on the right, we have two elements here, processor and memory. We have several unidirectional signals. This is one control signal for specifying whether this is a read operation or write operation. And we have an enable signal, which is also unidirectional. And we have a bus, a set of wires that is used to specify the exact location of the data item. And lastly, we have this data bus, which you can see here is a bidirectional, because this well, it could be a DRAM that you can either read or write to this device. 
So we said that bus is a set of wires with single function. In order for two devices to talk, they also they often follow certain protocol. By protocol, we refer to the rules for communication. The second concept is port or ports. Ports or the physical pins are used to connecting the device to other components. It's the conducting device on periphery. It is used, or well, they are used to connect buses, um, for example, data bus or address bus for processor and memory. These ports sometimes are referred to as pins. The actual pins on IC are used to make the connection. You can do soldering, you can put into, uh, put the component onto a PCB board by connecting their pins to the um, soldering lines. Sometimes they are metallic balls instead of pins, and sometimes they are pads uh, in the modern chips. We explained a little bit about the timing diagram. Timing diagrams are the most common method for describing a communication protocol. The way to look at timing diagram is you assume that on the horizontal axis or the x axis you have a time that proceeding from left to right. And on the y axis you have the signals that are significant in this protocol. The control signals could be high or low, and they're representing they're represented using this um, solid lines. Keep in mind that some control signals may be active low, which is represented using this um, special uh, signal here, or um, using the bar, or using um, some other labels to specify this is active low. And when we use the term assert, means we will make this signal active. And deassert, which means we're gonna um, make the signal not active. So for the active low signals, by saying asserting the signal, we actually mean to put a logic zero, or low voltage, on that pin. Data signals are considered either valid or not valid, depending on the timing. Uh, this single solid line, that's uh, invalid, and this two solid lines, that's solid. And I mean, that's valid signals, valid data. Protocols may have sub-protocols. For example, for uh, memory operations or memory bus cycles, you could have read or write, uh, and each may take different number of clock cycles. And we have an example here. Uh, in this read protocol, what you want to do is, um, first you want to put this read control signal as low, and then you will supply a valid address on the address bus, and then you will assert this enable signal. By that we mean we're going to change the signal from zero to one because this is a active high. And after a certain delay, okay, the data will become valid. That's how you see here, it's uh, changing from a single line to a double solid line. That's an indication of this data values valid on the data bus. Now we want to introduce a few bus, uh, basic protocol concepts. First, the actors. Uh, essentially, in the protocol, oftentimes we have a master that initiates the operation, and we have a slave or servant that responds to the um, initiation of the master. 
if we look at the direction, we have sender and receiver that uh, basically looking at how the data uh, item flows from one component to the other component. Addresses are special kind of data. Uh, they are used to specific location. Time multiplexing. This is an important concept. Time multiplexing is to share a single set of wires for multiple pieces of data. <coughs> we have seen different examples before. One of them is the row address and the column address of DRAM chips. That's a typical example of time multiplexing. For the same set of wires, at one time, one cycle, they are used for row address, and next cycle, they are used for column address. There are um, some chips, for example, the early Intel um, chips, they have multiplexed the address and data. So for the same set of physical wires, at one time, the first cycle, they are used as address bus. And the next cycle, or well, a few cycles later, they are used as data bus to transfer data. So that's another example of time multiplexing. The reason for doing this is to save wires at the expense of time, or to save the wires uh, for the sake of the cost. For example, the DRAM, uh, the reason we have row address and column address is because of, we cannot afford to have so many address wires for that chip. The figures at the bottom shows you time multiplex data transfer. Um, the example on the left, where you have a master and you have a servant, and both of them uh, have a 16-bit data register. There is one control signal, the request, and there is a data bus, which is only 8-bit. So as a result, when you want to transfer the data, the 16-bit data, you have to spend two bus cycles. You're essentially multiplexing this data bus for the upper half of the word and then lower half of the word. This other example, uh, again, we have a master and a servant. We have request for the data transfer and in this case, they are using the same set of wire to multiplex address and data. So if you see the timing diagram, in the first request, it'll first supply address from the master to servant. And then the next request cycle, the data will be present on the bus. In the next couple of slides, we want to introduce some different control methods when doing the communication. We start with the so-called strobe protocol. In this example, we have a, a master and a servant, and we have a request, which is a control signal from the master to the servant, and we have a data bus, and what we want to do here is the master will send a request and hopefully the servant will reply with data. So what's happening, if you look at the timing diagram, the first step is the master will assert the request. When the master asserts the request, that means the re request signal is turned from logic zero to logic one. And the servant sees that because it's the same wire. It knows there's a voltage change. Then the servant will prepare the data. And for example, it will load the content, the real data, from its internal memory. So that takes some time. And in the second step, the servant will put data on the data bus within the T of access. This is the access time. And then the master will receive the data, and after it's finished reading the data, it will deassert that request signal. 
So this is what we call strobe. So essentially we use one signal, the request in this example, as a way to synchronize the operation. Because using this single wire, both of them knows when the request happens and when the request finishes. The second protocol is called handshake. So we again have two communication parties, master and servant. In addition to the request and data signals, we have a third one, which is called acknowledgement. So we have one way of telling some information from the servant to the master, what we call this feedback from the servant to the master. Using th this timing diagram, let's look at how the communication happens. So again, first, the master will raise the request. Okay. I'm going to ask for data. Now the second step, the servant will put data on the bus, which is the same as the stop protocol, but also it will do one more thing. It will assert acknowledgement. And the next step is the master will receive data and deassert the request. And the servant will <coughs> subsequently deassert the acknowledgement. So using this acknowledgement, the servant has a chance to tell the master whether the data is ready or not. Okay, that's the uh, additional feature uh, compared to the basic stroke protocol. Here is, is the third one, which is called a uh, strobe handshake compromised protocol. Well, let's see how this works. Similarly to the handshake, we have a feedback coming from servants to the master. And here we specifically call this as a wait signal. The definition of the wait is that if this wait signal is asserted, that's an indication of the servant is not ready. So the master should not perform actual read operation to grab data from the data bus. This wait signal is helpful, especially for the low response case. Before we explain the low response case, let's look at the fast response case. So we have, in this timing diagram, we have three signals, request, wait, and data. The first is, again, the master will request. Now, you see in this case, wait signal is not asserted. Okay. It remains low, or logic zero. That means the servant is telling the master that you don't have to wait. Data is ready. You can grab it right away. So that's the meaning of deasserting this wait. So the wait line is unused. The master will just receive the data and deassert the request. Yes. Yeah, so the master has to do some checking on the wait line. If it sees a asserted wait, in other words, if it sees a one on that wait signal, it has to wait. It cannot continue the read operation. <laughs> Can you say it louder? So um, you're talking about the delay, control delay within the microprocessor itself, okay? So after, right after the request comes out from the master, if you imagine there's a state machine in the master device, 
The next state is to check the weight line. Yeah, so within the next cycle, it has to start checking the weight line. Okay. Of course, it depends on the actual implementation, but the conceptually, you can think about there is a state machine in the master device. After the request signal is sent out, the next state, it has to start checking the weight line. If it doesn't see anything, then it can go to the next state, which is to perform the read operation. Now, if we look at the slow response case on uh, here, so what's happening, which is different from the first case, is that the servant asserts the weight signal. So that's an indication that there's something going on on my side, either my storage device is very slow or something, that I cannot produce valid data within your expected time, within your next cycle. So this weight signal will cause the master to stay in that weight checking state until the servant deassert this weight signal. And only after that, the master will perform the read operation and then deassert uh, the request. This is another example, uh, ISA bus protocol, which is um, industry standard architecture for early, I mean, 80s, early 90s. Um, it's not used anymore in modern computer systems, uh, but this is an example uh, how these, how these devices talk if they are connected to the um, ISA bus. I will not go into the details of this particular example. <laughs>